So um, hi, everyone, and welcome to our latest um, Citizen Lab webinar. The conversation today is all about the new social housing regulations coming in place in 2023 and how you can boost engagement to be um, a little bit more compliant with them. Just before we start, a few quick housekeeping rules. The first one is that the session is recorded, and I will be sending the recording to all of you who registered for the webinar. The second one is that there should be a Q&A functionality where you can leave your questions anytime, but we will cover them at the end of the session. So there'll be about 30 minutes of a sort of fireside type of chat with our two panelists, and then we'll leave about 10, 15 minutes um, for any questions coming from the audience. So for those of you who um, don't know Citizen Lab, uh, we support Support organizations, mostly local councils and public organizations with a digital engagement platform. These webinars, however, are not entirely about us, they're more about you. We try to cover topics that are important in your day to day work and give you some practical tips that you can take away and implement, incorporate in the work that you do. Today's session is really divided into um, sort of distinct parts. The first one is really going to cover the implications of the new social housing regulations. And for this, we have invited Rob from Cascade Communications. Rob, I don't know if now is maybe a good time for you to just say a few words about yourself and potentially the kind of work, the kind of clients that you work with as well. Yes, of course. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so my name is Rob Smith from Cascade Communications. So just to tell you a little bit about Cascade. We have been operating for around 11 years and we work in uh, campaigning engagement communications across the built environment. We've worked with a number of developers, house builders and a few housing associations across London as well, including uh, to name a few uh, Nottingham Genesis and Peabody. We've also worked with a few local authorities as well and very much looking forward to discussing some of the new social housing regulations today with Barry. Amazing. Thank you so much for being there. And then the second part, once we've covered those social housing regulations, the second part is going to take a step back from them and really focus on giving you some practical tips on how to prepare for a sound consultation process. And this is why we have invited Barry from the Consultation Institute, somewhat of a um, consultation guru. Um, Barry, I don't know if you want to say a few words about yourself as well um, quickly before we before we start the conversation. Uh, yes, I'm from the Consultation Institute, which is a not-for-profit best practice organisation founded in 2003. I'll tell you a little bit more about the Institute when I do my slot. Um, I've been working in public consultation for, oh gosh, um, since dinosaurs wore short trousers, so um, a long time. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much. So again, as a reminder, this webinar is only going to last about 40, 45 minutes. We try to keep it short. Um, we're going to start off with the um, with the kind of the questions in the conversation now, and then we'll leave some time for um, for Q and A at the end. So maybe Rob, if we um, if we start with you and talk about those new social housing regulations and the implications that they're going to have for the industry, um, could you maybe give us a bit of an overview of um, of those new regulations and who they're going to affect? Yes, of course. Um, so just to start with a brief overview. Um, so this year, the government confirmed that they were bringing forward a new social housing regulation bill, which will be introduced within this parliamentary season. Uh, so the main purpose of that bill is to increase social housing tenants' rights to better homes and to enhance their ability to hold their landlords to account. Um, and this obviously marks the latest in a series of responses to the Grenfell Tower tragedy. Um, so there was a number of uh, new regulations brought forward last year, including the Building Safety Act and uh, last the uh, Fire Safety Act. Um, do you want me to talk in more detail about that or is that helpful? Is that no, no, that's great. I mean, um, no, I think that's um, that's great. And then maybe um, if you could maybe um, tell us a little bit more about how those regulations have affected your clients, maybe um, tell us a little bit more about your clients and um, who you work with. That would be really interesting as well. Yes, of course. Um, so in terms of who is affected by uh, the regulations, I think there's, there's two series of groups, really. I think, firstly, they are registered providers and uh, social housing landlords. Um, so according to most recent data, I think there's about 1,600 providers across uh, England and a lot of those make up local authorities. And as I said, private providers such as uh, social housing um, associations. Um, so in terms of uh, our clients, um, I think there's obviously been, been uh, quite a big response since the Grenfell uh, Tower tragedy. Um, so in terms of why uh, they've been introduced, um, I think, you know, as I said, the Grenfell Tower tragedy was obviously quite a uh, wake up call, I think, for social housing. 
Um, and I think at the time, um, the Prime Minister said that obviously that they felt that social housing tenants had perhaps become too ignored. Um, and obviously they wanted to certainly change that. Um, so the main themes of um, after that tragedy, I think there was a consultation and um, a lot of residents said that they felt ignored um, and there was a lack of accountability, um, which is obviously why these uh, regulations have been brought forward. Um, so in terms of what these regulations uh, seek to set out, fundamentally, it's ensuring that homes are safe. It's ensuring that there is better transparency for uh, tenants with their landlords, um, ensuring that there's uh, safe and effective uh, resolutions to complaints, and obviously empowering uh, residents uh, and their landlords to be held accountable. Um, and what is maybe some of the kind of, you know, the the data that those social housing providers are going to have to um to gather in light of those new regulations through consultation and engagement with tenants yes of course um so i think the the first thing is about creating a tenant satisfaction measure uh, for landlords uh, so it assesses things such as how repairs are carried out uh, building safety how complaints are handled and the engagement and with the neighborhood management um, it also creates a new information scheme for uh, social housing tenants and other private uh, residence providers um, to obviously put together uh, that information and ensuring that uh, landlords are providing a clear breakdown of how uh, their income is being spent, um, including obviously things like repair work, for example. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And um, at the moment, what kind of, you know, um, solutions are your clients exploring in terms of meeting those um, regulations? Could you tell us a little bit more about um, uh, some of the advice that you're giving them in terms of meeting those regulations um, and what kind of tools or solutions they're looking at in order to be a little bit more compliant with that? Yes, of course. I think um, picking up on the dealing with the complaints, making sure that repair work is carried out in a timely uh, way. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing more is the use of technology. Um, so, for example, mobile apps, uh, which can be used uh, to log uh, reports with issues uh, with flats, etc. Obviously, makes that process a little bit easier. Good. Um, and um, maybe, you know, I'm just kind of thinking, um, you know, in terms of consultation more broadly, so you're mentioning kind of messaging systems and so on. Um, what is, you know, how does the place of consultation kind of um, change in light of those new regulations? Um, is it becoming more kind of important? Um, what are some of the changes that you're um, observing in that area and how it's incorporated in the services that social housing providers offer? Yes, of course. If you don't mind, I'll answer that question a little bit differently. So I'll talk about how it's affected our clients and potentially yeah. how that will then later affect consultation. Um, yeah. So I think the first big thing is fire safety. And I think a lot of councils are, of course, adjusting to the latest health and safety uh, advice and advice for the London Fire Brigade. And there's a question about whether local plans will potentially have to change in order to uh, meet that advice. Um, so we're seeing a lot more uh, recommendations, for example, for a second staircase in Tor buildings and we've seen a number of examples of this across London so about six months ago there was an example in Canary Wharf where the application uh, for new residential building uh, was postponed by the applicant last minute because the London Fire Brigade had come forward um, and said that they didn't feel comfortable with the fact there was only one uh, stairwell in the entire building so the applicant went away uh, took another look at the design which subsequently led to a second stairwell being added and the London Fire Brigade later added that they appreciated that they'd taken this time to reflect on their plans and obviously added the second staircase and I think we'll see potentially a lot more uh, engagement with the London Fire Brigade and other statutory consultations consultees earlier on in the process. Mm -hmm. Okay yeah that makes sense. Um... Okay, and maybe could you maybe tell us a little bit more? I'm wondering about, um, you know, what kind of, you know, um, tools, you know, those um, organizations that you work with, your clients kind of use to be able to engage specifically with the residents and the tenants of those places. Uh, yes, of course. Give me a moment. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned earlier about, I think mobile apps were definitely something that um, can be used uh, later on in the process to deal with um, complaints. Yeah. So it's just kind of maybe leveraging a little bit more the digital tools that are yeah, around in order to definitely. adapt and I to think we've 
as a result of the uh, pandemic, we've certainly seen a lot more uh, digital engagement. I think that's very much come to the forefront of consultations. We see a lot more online webinars, for example, like this forum, which I think makes consultation a little bit more accessible for those who wouldn't necessarily be able to engage previously. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, and yeah, I don't know if, I mean, um, you have anything to show around that, but anything around kind of the main challenges in terms of, you know, actually being able to get feedback and input from tenants. Um, not sure if you if you kind of work around that, if you have any any observations from your day to day kind of work in terms of what, it, you know, what the difficulties are in terms of collecting that input from from tenants and potentially how you help those um, those clients kind of being able to access those tenants and getting that information from them. Um, not particularly, but I think uh, Barry may have some tips about consultation and broadly how we perhaps gauge with uh, tenants uh, in future. Yeah, definitely. Okay, interesting. Um, thanks for giving us a bit of an overview of how, um, you know, of, of what those new regulations mean for the industry and what kind of data is going to be gathered. Um, do you have any advice for social housing providers in terms of navigating those changes and in terms of, you know, adapting to the new, um, to the new regulations? Yes, of course. I think I would say definitely embrace these standards. Um, they're not going to go away. I think we're only going to see a uh, more of these kind of regulations coming forward. So I think definitely work with local councils because I think um, if you, for example, have got lots of projects in a particular borough, I think that will certainly help with stakeholder relationships uh, going forward um, between uh, local council leaders, uh, councillors, tenants, and broadly speaking, councils in more general. Mm -hmm. Great, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so let's maybe now that we have a little bit of an understanding of how, you know, um, what's coming up in terms of social housing regulations, how they've evolved over the last few years um, following the Grenfell disaster and what they mean in terms of trying to get closer to tenants and using their input in order to um, inform the decision making process and, and the changes that we make to social housing. Maybe we can now move to, to the actual consultation process. So what do we actually do? How do we actually get to those tenants and how do we gather that information? So Barry, I'm going to turn to you, the expert on consultation, um, and hopefully we can get some tips from you in terms of as we're kind of nearing 2023 and all of those new regulations are coming into place. I'm sure that a lot of um, uh, of people in our audience will be um, will be wondering about how they can prepare for a consultation and what steps they need to take. So before we actually talk about the preparation of that consultation process if you can maybe tell us a few words about the consultation institute i'm sure that everyone on this call has heard about it but giving us a little bit of an overview of the kind of work that you do would be um would obviously be really interesting sure uh thanks laura um uh, and thanks rob also uh that, that's that's got me in a, a useful frame um the institute as i said before we're a not-for-profit organization um we work a lot with public bodies a little bit in the private sector mostly public bodies uh, and we offer uh we've been going since 2003 and what we do is we offer training we offer advice and guidance and we run a quality assurance program, which basically means we hold your hand throughout a consultation. Um, uh, and we set up, we are a sort of public think tank on consultation. We comment very publicly on government consultations, for example. Um, and um, we're a membership organization. So you can join as an individual or as an organization uh, or indeed uh, as a corporate body um and for that you get newsletters and free advice to a certain extent discount on courses uh, and as i said we do live training we also have an e-learning program uh, so we cover areas like preparing for consultation, running a consultation, mm -hmm. stakeholder mapping, the law of consultation, which is hugely important these days because we see a lot of organisations taken to judicial review because they've not consulted properly. Um, we cover things like equalities, co-production, community engagement, mm -hmm. digital consultation, to pick up Rob's point there. Uh, we, I, I personally, I'm a methodologist, so mm -hmm. I take talk about how to run focus groups, how to write surveys, how to do data analysis. Um, our recent addition, actually, we're, we're sort of moving into the other side of the equation, has been a taster course, which is free at the moment, called You're Asking Me, which is for uh, the sort of people who respond to consultations, uh, some of your tenants, for example, Rob, uh, to find out um, how uh, what a consultation should look like and what their consultor should be doing. 
so you know consultors beware we are arming your <laughs> we are arming your consultees um we have a small headquarters team uh, but most of us are independent consultants ourselves that uh, are um, associates of the institute i'm both an associate and a fellow and so the institute can for specific pieces of work farm stuff out so they'll assign you somebody like me to come and help you uh, that's us <laughs> yeah, amazing. Thank you. Um, no, and your expertise and the consultation expertise is so sort of spans across the whole kind of spectrum of the consultation process, oh, yes. uh, which is yeah. why it was quite difficult for us as well, you and me, when we were preparing this webinar to actually, um, you know, focus on one little bit of that process, which is going to be most useful to our audience today. Um, and it is the preparing for consultation um, module or training kind of um, component of the um, of the program that I that I looked at and thought this would be really interesting as we move towards those regulations um how can we approach those first steps um and prepare for a consultation um a consultation process so i guess uh, my um my first question in terms of preparing for a consultation is going to be uh, around targeting your audience could mm. you maybe um could you maybe tell us what your recommendations would be as those social housing providers look to target their audience um and engage with them in order to inform their decision making process yeah i mean i think uh, one of the things we talk about a lot in the institute is stakeholder mapping um which can be either at uh, quite a micro level which is that there are very small differences between the stakeholders or it can be at a macro level which is you know if you're doing a massive consultation and if effectively what that is is on a rough kind of a graph you're looking at interest versus influence so how interested are people in this and what influence do they have to change things um and it in doing this process you really have to think about the people who are going to be affected and i think that's affected by the decisions you make now in terms of housing that seems obvious it's obviously tenants but it may not be as obvious as that it may be for instance postal services it may be delivery service i mean increasingly we get stuff delivered these days you know from from uh, large company vans and things it could be uh people who live in the area it, it, it could be, you know, uh, shops, it could be all sorts of things. So it's actually about having a really good think. And I, I think at the basis for every good consultation, I, I always say this is integrity. You have to want to do this. You, you have to approach consultation with the idea that it's going to help you. It's not, you know, of course, it's going to help the people you're consulting with but it's also going to help you it's in your own interest to find out what people want and what people you, okay it's not a vote you don't have to do it but if you approach this with an open sense of i want to find stuff out in order that i can serve these people better then it will um it will put you in a mindset which allows you to always be open to new stakeholders saying please can i have a say in this? i have an interest and that's you know you don't go through a tunnel saying i know who my stakeholders are you have to be open to the fact that there may be more stakeholders than you imagine and the process of stakeholder mapping will get you thinking uh, in the first instance about what sort of stakeholders you do have now in terms of targeting them uh, i would say that no two consultations are the same uh, one of the things we recommend is stakeholder portals so again that's an online thing basically you advertise your presence and say if you ever want to comment on something that we these are online portals uh, that we are doing please give us your details so that we can include you on our stakeholder lists um uh, one of the big things uh, that, that comes up again and again particularly in the law is equality impact assessments so mm -hmm. it, it, that's to say there may well be people whom you haven't considered who are a subset of your stakeholders who fall into one of the protected characteristics under the equality uh the 2010 equalities act so um you know they 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 may be disabled that's an obvious one but some of the stuff you're doing may 
unfairly um, uh, affect, uh, for instance, married people, or it may affect uh, people who are pregnant. Mm. Uh, and those, yeah, those are protected characteristics. So you have to think about your equalities, and that's a very good area for, for looking at how you might target people. Mm -hmm. uh, health inequalities are also a big thing these days I mean mostly we look at this with in the health sector but you know there are health inequalities connected with housing obviously mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really interesting so what I'm really getting in terms of the message is trying to look beyond the um the, the stakeholders that are obvious at first sight and try to map that out yeah. and really understand the impact of the work that we do in social housing on different groups of people and make sure that we are that's right I, I mean we we have a series of tests that we recommend first who is directly impacted by your the decision you're about to make who is indirectly impacted who is potentially impacted whose help is needed to make the decision work who knows about the subject who will have an interest in the subject those are six areas that you should really consider mm, um, very interesting mm. and in terms of um i don't know if you can tell us maybe a little bit more about um reaching out to those um to those to that audience to that target audience and i'm interested if ever you do have a bit of information of how that has changed over the last few years with COVID and so on whether new ways of reaching out to um to the audience have have come across well, I, I think firstly, the thing to say is that you can't just rely on one way. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, uh, and, and of course, COVID limited us to some extent to it narrowed the field down quite a lot so that, you know, it, it, personal face-to-face uh, -face interactions became difficult, if not impossible. Yeah. And we, we did tend to end up with uh, very much more electronic communications and stuff like this. Um, I, I, although I ran a, a kind of consultation up in Scotland during the COVID period entirely by letter. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, it was an interesting one um, because that's the way they wanted it. But the thing is, you it, in any consultation, you have to consider that you cannot, by the means you consult, exclude anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not just a case of this is this is the one we'll go for. Actually, you should you should always consider a paper based version of what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. Rob mentioned, you know, a very instant feedback through apps and things. And of course, that is that is absolutely a, a, a new way of doing things. I mean, we used to talk about SMS. Yep. Messaging, but yeah. sort of a little bit old. Yeah. Down, yeah. You know. yeah. Uh, but certainly what you would be looking at is having as many channels as possible. So you'd have a, a, a dedicated portal online, but you'd also have uh, used the various social media um, platforms mm -hmm. to highlight what you're doing, uh, down to notices in public libraries, uh, down to notices in shops. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination uh, of methods to make sure that you reach everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you can't yeah. buy your channels, and actually, this has been covered in in case law, and case mm -hmm. law is mm -hmm. behind a lot of what we advise. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't exclude people because of uh, uh, being limited in the channels. Yeah. In the channels that you have. I know I said we would answer Q&A from the audience at the end, but um, one person is wondering if you could just repeat the six areas that you mentioned. Oh, sure. Yes. Um, so that they can make a note. Now, who is directly? impacted by this decision who is indirectly impacted by the decision who is potentially impacted whose help is needed to make the decision work who knows about the subject so that they may not be involved in the decision at all but they will have they will have some useful information to give you um, and who will have an interest in the subject, and that is much more broad. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to repeat that. Mm. Um, Chris, let us know if you still have questions, but I hope you... Sure, I can write them down for you if you want. I'm I wouldn't sure. worry, Barry. I'm going to share the recording so everyone right. will have access right. okay. um, to it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Um, next question would be around... Um, 
you know, um, the, the kind of engagement, the kind of consultation that we're talking about with those social housing um, regulations is statutory, it's official. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of engagement can social housing providers do before they even start engaging in that formal consultation in a way that it can help them either better design that consultation or get more information before they even jump into the official consultation process? Yeah, I mean, as I said before, integrity is everything. Uh, and you have to start with the view, the premise that the consultation will help the process and not hinder it. It's not something bolt on. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's something you need, you both need to do because you're required to do by law, but you should be interested in doing. And from that, if you come into it with that attitude, you will be open to a lot of the ideas of engagement. Uh, and, and I would say. You, you, any consultation should have some sort of engagement uh face to face if possible uh a, a more qualitative form of things before any formal consultation takes place because it helps you to understand the issues it helps you to understand uh what the problems are and i'm talking here uh, i mean it can be uh exchange on social media it can be formal focus groups it can be workshops it can be just chatting to people it can be having a, a public meeting it can be having uh, a, a, an exhibition often is a useful thing with people wandering around just taking notes of what people are saying or having little yeah. little mini interviews in the exhibition I mean particularly with housing and, and, and planning and things like that those those are a lot those are a lot of things but yeah. I, I mean that engagement will enable you to to be able to frame the formal questions you ask when you formally consult consult um it it will enable you to understand what the issues are and a rough idea of their importance uh, mm -hmm. when you're starting to write questions for formal consultation you'll be able to think about the language to to frame them in it will also enable you to to close questions down so you give you know what the what people are saying so you then have a series of possible statements that people can tick rather mm -hmm. than just saying what do you think about this yeah. Or you can guide it a little bit better and gear it in the in the right direction. Exactly. So, uh, I mean, we talk about, as I, I've mentioned, some of the things, public meetings, deliberative events are quite useful things. I mean, we can talk about those further outside of this, I think. <laughs> uh, uh, co-production is, is, yeah. is, I mean, co-production is a really interesting because that's beyond consultation. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, we had a a, a, a case of a, a, a clinical commission group that I was involved in a few years ago, pre-pandemic, uh, they um, had to shift uh, some orthopaedic services around in North London. Uh, it was sort of scattered around different hospitals and the idea was to concentrate it into hospitals. And actually, um, when it, they did so much work through GP surgeries, through patient groups through all sorts of things beforehand that actually they co-produced their their option that they, they had actually co-produced the solution before mm -hmm. they consulted on it so although they went out to consultation on just a single option which isn't really our advice normally actually everybody loved it because everybody had been involved in building that option Mm -hmm. so, you know it saves you some heartache and some work <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely uh we're getting another question actually from uh, from the audience so i'm just gonna um uh, throw them in here as we go along because they're so connected to what you're talking about and it's fresh in your mind now um steve is asking what is the best way to avoid bias um steve if you want to add a little bit more detail about what it, bias in what in what kind of context um let us know barry i don't know if you have initial kind of thoughts on avoiding bias and some tips that we can that we pass we can pass along Yes, I mean, a lot depends on, I think, what Stephen means by bias. I mean, uh, in terms of, you have to accept that bias exists. You, you cannot entirely uh, rule it out. get rid of, rule, rule out bias, but you have to recognise it where it happens. You have to be alert to it. You have to be alert to, and, and again, this goes back to your integrity of approach. You, yeah. you have to approach a consultation with the thought that what anybody says may be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. and, and you can set up systems. I mean, for example, when you are 
one of the areas where that we concentrate a lot on these days in pre-consultation engagement is options uh, options um, uh, development and options appraisal mm -hmm. uh, and there are systems that you can put in place for appraising options that mean you get a little group together to set criteria uh, and then you get a whole different group together then to take uh, all of the options that people have come up with and apply those criteria and score them so that when you come to the final consultation, you will have just a series of a few options. But they've been through a relatively rigorous process. Yeah. And it makes sense. I mean, um, that's so, just one example of how. Yeah, no, I, I think that helps. And in the meantime, Steve said, I mean, seeking a predeter predetermined outcome through questions you ask. So I think you kind of. Ooh, answered. Uh, 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 <laughs> you should never do that. Uh, <laughs> that that uh, because if you get taken to a judicial review and we've had cases, we've seen cases on this. <laughs> You'll be in trouble. <laughs> I'll soon see through that. Mm -hmm. and one of the one of the bit prime bits of case law on consultation it, it, it are the gunning principles and i won't go into them now but the first of those is that consultation must can only take place when um uh, proposals are in a formative stage so okay. you can't take a decision and, and then consult yeah. the, con the consultation has to and any kind of evidence that suggests that you have already taken the decision and, and there have been some fairly minimal bits of evidence that have that have yeah. lost consultation uh, and bias of questions is one of them uh if you get taken to judicial review you know, you're going to be in trouble in trouble yeah yeah um Another question that is coming up is around the quality impact assessments. Um, do you can you carry out a, a, an equality impact assessment after the consultation and then return to targeting if communities have not been involved or participated in the consultation? When you can, but I would suggest that actually um, one of the things we always suggest is that actually quality impact monitoring should be a constant process. Mm -hmm. It, it it shouldn't be all right let's just look at the equalities now no. yeah should be part of the process it's probably one of the very first thing an, an equality impact assessment is probably one of the very first things you ever do before you even think about consultation you need mm. to know who, who what your population looks like yeah where do they fall so that because in order to consult properly you've got to be able to understand who's going to be affected by the decision and yeah. if certain groups of people that fall under the Equality Act are going to be adversely affected more than others, you can't get away with that by yeah. just doing it at the end. Yeah, yeah. So, unfortunately, so, I mean, after, <laughs> we're going to start uh, all of it over again. <laughs> well, a full consultation process with pre-engagement, you'll be doing equality impact assessments at regular points. Yeah, yeah. regular points, continuous throughout yeah. the process. I mean, but, ideally yeah. continuous, but, but you know, and that's a proper one. That isn't yeah. just on paper. That's actually then engaging with those groups to make yeah. sure that you've got your facts right. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and lots of thank yous from the from the group as well, Barry, just so you know. Um, let's move on to the kind of um, to the format of those consultations. And um, um, a lot of time, those formal consultations will take the shape of a survey. Um, what would be your top tips to set up a, a good kind of consultation, um, a, a survey consultation? OK, well, my first three tips, I've covered the first one already. Always do some sort of pre-consultation engagement. Helps you frame the language of the questionnaire. It will help close down the questions and it will also give you some valid options to play with. OK. My second tip is uh, I, this is a thing I when I train, I talk a lot about is Barry's world. We all have worlds in which we live in our heads. We do. <laughs> um, and um, so. I have Barry's world, you have Laura's world, you know, Rob has Rob's world. One of the biggest problems I come across in survey questions is people haven't got out, the people asking the questions haven't got out of their own world. Mm -hmm. Okay, they ask them in a way that, and, and this goes back to the question of bias again, but they ask them in a way that, that they understand and that oh. follows their logic. You can't do that because there's people out there do, do not run in that way. I mean, 
to take a small moment it, and it's more than about language it's not just the language you use or or getting out of acronyms or jargon or all of that sort of stuff it's actually the way you think so a hospital administrator for example uh always thinks of clinical stuff in terms of their grade you know in terms of their in terms of their rotors in terms of where they fit in the ladder of the hierarchy within it so you know asking questions about when you came into hospital did you see a, a, a consultant or a, 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 a you know a, a registrar or a, you know all of those things actually patients just see someone who's a doctor or a nurse you know they, they don't know they're great they don't care I just want to be a doctor. And, yeah. and so it, it, it's actually understanding the world from your consultee's point of view is a huge, huge, huge thing to remember. So that's the second point. Mm -hmm. And my third point is always start with the data you need, never with the questions. What do you, what is it, what is the data that you have to have in order to take this decision? What facts do you need to know from what, what opinions do you need to know from people in order for you to take this decision? Then you go to the questions. So mm, always okay. start from, from the back yeah. end of a survey, not that don't just start writing questions. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to write a little blog post about all of this. This is amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing those tips. Really useful. Um, I mean, for housing and so many of the other products. Well, you know, when you get, you've got all your questionnaire data back and you think, Oh, so um, what's what's going to be what, what's going to be the difference here between, uh, you know, people uh, between, uh, I don't know, let's take, for example, between um, uh, people who are over 60 and people who are under 60. Mm. Oh, I didn't ask them their age. Mm. Oh, damn. <laughs> but it, it's all over again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's really, that's really, really helpful. Um, Beyond surveys, though, so a lot of, and I, I guess that a lot of the work that we do, so we, um, our platform has a kind of toolbox of different different methods, and we see that surveys are used a lot. Of course, they are the most kind of popular tool, engagement, a consultation tool um, when you're trying to do an official kind of statutory consultation. Um, helps you to really get all of the information that you need and in the, in the shape and form that you needed. I'm just wondering, though, we're always kind of thinking about are there other methods methods out there, maybe a little bit more innovative, maybe a little bit more incentivizing for users um, that could help shape a formal consultation process beyond just using a survey, maybe in combination. I don't know what your thoughts are on that and, and whether you kind of give any advice on that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as I said earlier, a, a good consultation would always involve a mix of methods anyway. You can't, you can't, it's not just a mix of channels, it's a mix of methods mm -hmm. uh, because because some people work better face to face some people you know and we have to address the the business also of qualitative and quantitative data now when i started life out i was very much a quantitative man and surveys produce huge amounts of quantitative data quantitative data is not always helpful because actually the devil is usually in opinion and detail when it comes to consultation so i have become a much more of a fan of qualitative data but of course the two are very different mm. and uh there are lots of ways of explaining the difference but i think a useful one for, for for this answering this question is that qualitative inquiry is about hypothesis construction and mm -hmm. quantitative inquiry is about hypothesis testing mm -hmm. so you, you, put, you use qualitative to put together what you think might be happening what you think people think what you know but quantitative which is essentially what you're doing with a survey is testing it so you're going for the numbers mm -hmm. how yeah. many people think this way now <laughs> for us in the consultation business the three things that you want to get out of a consultation is what's being said who is saying it and that's really important so who says what mm -hmm. and a rough idea of strength of opinion so the quant stuff is not always uh, and certainly because it isn't a vote quantitative is not is not as important as you think it is so actually something like a survey can be helpful but it is not always helpful and uh things like focus groups deliberative event public exhibitions i've mentioned where you have uh now there are other sort of more um fancy schmancy ways of of getting qualitative 
uh, information. There's a technique called appreciative inquiry. There's something called World Cafe, uh, Citizens Assemblies, obviously social yeah. media. We actually run a course at the Institute on some of these innovative uh, means of uh, means of collecting data. I mean, particularly, we look at appreciative in inquiry and World Cafe and Citizens Assemblies. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a lot of tools open to you. And, and they're not just pre-consultation, but during consultation. So things like workshops and focus groups are a great way to engage with uh, particular groups of people so for instance uh, people people from a particular protected characteristic or yeah. sort of thing they're a much better way because yeah. you get some really in-depth opinions and, yeah yeah quality and, and the other thing i would certainly say is always think about taking it to them rather than them coming to you uh so make every effort to open to to keep a channel of communication open so mm. if that means going to them i mean and this is a big often a big thing for example with traveler communities uh then i mean obviously that won't apply to housing <laughs> um but but um you know being prepared to go out into the field is always the best option there. the best way of getting the information yeah mm. Amazing. That's um, so interesting. Um, I really feel like I learned a lot. So I hope that everyone else on the call as well. Um, we are running out of time. So I suggest we, um, we wrap up. Thank you so, so much to both of you for your input. I just want to check if anyone else has questions. So let me just check the Q&A. Um, I answered, we answered quite a, quite a few of them as we were talking. So I think that will probably be it, but let's give everyone a minute or so to, um, to ask any questions either in the chat or the Q&A. Otherwise, as I said, um, this is all being recorded. So we will be sharing the recording with all of you. We will try to put a little blog post together um, with a short introduction to what Rob shared in terms of the, um, the impact of the housing, um, new housing regulations and um, a few kind of paragraphs on the tips, the really useful tips that Barry said in terms of preparing that, that consultation process. Um, and of course, in terms of the, the next steps, beyond on preparation, I would highly recommend having a look at the Consultation Institute um, website and even getting in touch. Um, Barry, Rob, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll share your details as well with the audience. Sure. If, if they have any questions, to. if they want to, amazing, if they want to get in touch. Um, and otherwise, um, thank you so much to both of you for, um, for joining me today. It's been really, really interesting. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time, Laura. <laughs> Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.